And so for those of you who might not know, Horizon Zero Dawn is an open world action role playing game exclusive for the PlayStation 4 and is set in a lush post post apocalyptic world where gigantic machines have taken over and humanity is no longer the dominant species. Uh, so, who is Gorilla? Um, Gorilla, is, uh, Gorilla Games is a Sony first party developer from Amsterdam. And until recently, we have been known for a series of PlayStation exclusive uh, first person shooters known as, known as Killzone. And these have been six titles uh, on five different platforms. And that means we have been making first person shooters for over a decade. So around 2010, we had this idea that we'd like to try something new, something different. And after months of pitching, discussions, the project that would become Horizon was approved. A big, ambitious, open world RPG. Essentially, a new adventure would await us. So how did Horizon come to be? Uh, around 2010, so when Killzone 3 was still being developed for PlayStation 3, uh, there was this idea, let's make something new. And let's involve everyone in the company to do that. So there was this open call for pitches and ideas. And there were about 40 submissions for, uh, for ideas for what Gorilla might do next. And out of these 40, actually there was only one shooter and uh, actually a lot of RPGs. It uh, seemed obvious that Gorilla would like to do something new. Uh, and out of these two, there were two most promising ones. One was this alternate history, steampunkish, noirish third person action adventure, and a post apocalyptic open world role playing game set in this beautiful, green, lush world. The project that in the end would become Horizon. Now, how I got involved in all that? So, uh, around 2010, I was still back in Poland, so only a couple of years later, uh, Gorilla started looking for, for new people. And uh, I used to work as a professional dungeon master for pen and paper role-playing games. And I was making mobile games for five years, and I released almost 20 games on 10 different platforms. So Gorilla was looking for an experienced coder who knew about RPGs, and I sort of fit the bill. But what, was, what uh, is relevant here is that Little did I know that my experience making small mobile games would actually prove useful in a AAA studio. So what was the Horizon situation uh, during that time? First of all, it was a new intellectual property. Second of all, it was a new type of game for us. And that meant that the level of complexity on every field got much, much uh, bigger. So in terms of technology, design, production, everything, it was the next level of uh, complexity for all of us. To make it even worse, 2010, this is still PlayStation 3 era, and this was supposed to be a PlayStation 4 title. So uh, apart from changing the whole engine, there was a new platform to fight. So what did we do to mitigate all that risk? So first of all, we decided to um, take our time while developing, prototyping, and pre-producting uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, second of all, we decided that we will make a different game in the meantime for PlayStation 4 as a launch title, and that ended up being Killzone Shadowfall. And uh, during that period, while Killzone Shadowfall was in production, Horizon used the exact same code. So essentially, Horizon was like a mod for Killzone at the time. Now, um, we also used Killzone as sort of this technological and also design springboard. So if you see on your uh, left, Killzone 3 and Killzone Shadowfall, these are very different games. So if you look at these three in succession, you can see that Shadowfall is exact middle in many ways between Killzones and Horizons. And it is like a map of things that we would like to do. Now, for me, doing this prototyping of Horizon Zero Dawn was familiar territory. Uh, why? Well, there is a sharp contrast between working in a 200-people team and a 12-people team, right? In a big team, 
um, there are more procedures. The process is, of course, longer. Ideas have to go through certain channels. Meetings have to be called. But in a small team, you can just talk to the person involved, to the creative director, technical director, whoever is running that specific piece of a game that you're working on, uh, and just discuss things immediately. So even though we were in a big studio, uh, working this small on this small prototype really felt like making a mobile or an indie game. And actually the time we had for, all, for a lot of these things was, was comparable. So I would literally discuss and update designs in mid-implementation, just by turning around and finding the right person to talk to. Something not that very common in AAA development. Essentially, I slipped into my old mobile shoes and worked as I used to. And only gradually, as the team grew, as uh, more people started coming in, me, as well as everyone else, needed to change our habits. Um, so what was our process when it was uh, during Prototype and Horizon? Well, uh, when we looked at the map uh, ahead of us, we saw this big empty space with this gigantic menacing sign, here be dragons. We didn't know all that much about what game we will be making. So we needed to do some research. So that was a big part of the process. And also we went through a long, long period of ideation and prototyping. And of course, research and ideation prototyping pretty much happened at the same time. That led us to the development of our uh, vertical slice, which was sort of a mini demo trying to present what Horizon will be all about. Then we managed to branch from Killzone and actually do some big technical changes to, to the engine. And finally, we went into production. So let's talk a little bit about the research that we did. So we did need to create a lot of new systems, tools. We, need to update our, we needed to update our processes. So we decided to look at other games and other studios to see how they solved issues that would be ahead of us. And uh, each time we looked at a different studio or a different game, we tried to focus on specific issues. So let's quickly talk about that. First of all, we needed to have quests in our game. We never had anything like that. Horizon uh, Killzone had a very simple objective system. So we looked and played through many, many RPGs. Uh, everything from Fallout through Morrowind or The Witcher. Uh, and we tried to figure out how quests and quest system works in these kind of games. And we learned that although the field is not that wildly researched, it is actually quite deep and there's many, multi many different approaches to creating quests and managing quests in video games. But during our researches, we focused mostly on how quests are defined, what is the progression mechanic in quests, and what kind of information is presented to the player during uh, progressing quests. We also needed to... Um, have uh, unlockable skills, character progression in our game. Something, again, that didn't happen in Killzone. Uh, in Killzone, essentially the skills that you started the game with were the skills you ended up the skill with. You only changed the weapons every now and then. So again, we played through multiple games and we tried to focus on things like how are skills unlocked, how skills relate to each other and to other systems in the games, and how skills change over time. Another new thing was interactive dialogue. So in Killzone, we were able to play cutscenes. So we were able to animate uh, characters, uh, play dialogue, play voices, but you could never, as a player, steer the direction of, of such a cutscene. So we needed to implement a totally new system. So again, we focused on games which had that already, mostly Bioware games, because they are known for their quite uh, intense uh, dialogue sections, but also things like Risen or, again, The Witcher. And we looked mostly on things like how cameras work, how options are presented to the player, and how conversations flow in general. Another thing that uh, we need to focus on was inventory. Inventory systems in Killzone were very, very simple. Essentially, everything was either a weapon or a resource, meaning uh, like ammo or health or, or shields or something like that. And we needed a full-fledged inventory system. I mean, for every RPG, uh, for every RPG, loot is like the big part of, of, of playing, right? 
Uh, so, again, we play through many, many games and we focus mostly on things like what kind of items can there be? What functions do different kinds of items provide in the game? And how are items stored, transferred and discarded? Again, we needed to add crafting to our game. We wanted to have a robust crafting system, something which never existed in previous games. So, uh, we tried to look at some MMOs because uh, crafting MMOs is uh, super popular nowadays. We looked at uh, Rogue Galaxy, which is ancient, but for uh, crafting system is bananas. And we focus on things like what kind of items can be crafted, what are crafting how are uh, crafting recipes defined and given to the player, and how are crafting materials uh, defined. Um, and finally, we desperately needed to update our toolset. The way all kill zones were built was just insufficient for such ambitious project as Horizon. I mean, we used Maya as our level editor. So we tried to look through pretty much every tool we could find, uh, public, not public, that was used to build uh, similar games. And uh, what we found most relevant to us, the, the tools which were most relevant to us, were, ended up being actually the Aurora Toolkit, which was used to build Neverwinter Nights, the Red Kid, which was used to build The Witcher, and uh, also Unreal, en uh, Unreal Ed from Unreal Engine 4 proved uh, provided a lot of inspiration. And during our research into tools, we mostly focus on things like how our levels, quests and entities built and designed, pretty much any game object, how, it, how they are built and designed, how are assets managed, that's actually a big problem with these integrated tool sets, and how scripting works. Then we went through a process that um, is called intrinsic ideation. Now what is intrinsic ideation? Well, first of all, Ideation is a iterative process in which you generate and improve ideas. The way it worked for us is that we would for, uh, build a lot of prototypes. For every idea that we had, for everything that we thought should end up in the game, and on a, uh, we build a prototype, either to build, test technology or design or anything else. And of course it was building iterations. So we built a prototype, figured if it can be fun, improved upon it, if it, if it could be fun, if it was a trash idea from the start, we just wouldn't continue. And in this uh, agile, iterative process, we would uh, just improve and improve and improve. Intrinsic, in this case, means that every idea should fit to a certain p uh, set of fundamental pillars that we set up at, when set up at the beginning of uh, developing Horizon. So, um, when we had the idea what Horizon was supposed to be, we defined certain themes, certain ideas, certain pillars which every idea during this period needed to adhere to. And that is, uh, was to, uh, as our art director described it, to prevent the rule of the cool, right? So what is the rule of the cool? It's when you have a cool idea, you have another cool idea, so you put that cool idea on that previous cool idea, and you, then you put another cool idea, another one, and you end up with sharks with razor blades and laser eyes, which might be cool, but now it might not fit what you're building, right? So before we even build a prototype, we try to validate whether it supports what Horizon is supposed to be. Uh, and um, I will show you, I was actually allowed to do that, so that's, I'm super happy about it, to show you some of earlier prototypes that we, that we built for some, some, uh, some features. One which I couldn't show you, mostly because it would be difficult to, uh, was a small prototype called the Open World Prototype, which was um, essentially a mini open world game. So we had one square kilometer, not more, and we tried to put as much activities and ideas in this one area to see if you can actually build an interesting open world game in such a small uh, area just to test out open world ideas. But moving on. Um, one of the prototypes here it's will be our first, uh, first test of the Thunderjaw. Um, as you can see, this is not Aloy, this is actually Jammer from Killzone, because we, we, we used uh, models as much as we could. But that small uh, Lego kind of uh, uh, robot was our first prototype of, of the Raptor. And um, we, from the very start, had these ideas to have detachable parts, exploding elements, and uh, 
that was like the most, most extreme version of that, I think. Another, uh, another uh, interesting prototype that we had was our vegetation prototype. And this was essentially a prototype uh, supposed to test art and technology. First of all, we wanted to experiment with how forests should look, how um, to place trees, how to place um, plants and these kind of things, how to do god rays and mist and all the kind of uh, visual effects. But also we wanted to um, test if we can run it at 30 FPS, right? Because you jam so much stuff into that scene and at some point uh, the frame rate plummets. So that small level was just like big filled forest with, uh, with plants and we pretty much tested uh, performance and, and uh, placement. Um, another thing, if you played Horizon, you will know about Meridian. So Meridian was actually quite early in, the, uh, in development because we knew we wanted a big city. And this is uh, actually its early prototype where you could uh, still had a um, yeah, that's our test voices for all the characters. Um, but yeah, still, you still had, um, we still experimented with a physical horse, not a robot horse. Uh, and you could go into the, into the city on, on that horse. Uh, and yeah, we were testing merchants, we were testing how, much how many buildings, how many people we can jam into that scene uh, without destroying the frame rate again. Of course, this, uh, this city evolved a lot to become the meridian that you might know th from, uh, from the game. Uh, now, another prototype which we did a lot, actually this is, this is not like one of them, we had dozens of dozens of prototypes like this, because this tests combat. And in this case, you're hunting uh, mounted a bunch of harvesters. But uh, we had pretty much a combat prototype for every weapon, for every scenario, for every robot. And we would iterate over weapons, we would iterate over uh, making scenes, and over fighting mechanics as well. Um, if you look here, when Ayla is shooting, she uh, is actually uh, snaps d directly to parts of a robot. This is something we experimented with, which didn't end up in the game. But yeah, uh, there was a lot of these small, bigger ideas that we were thinking about putting in, or, or not. And the final thing I wanted to show you is something uh, which never happened, but hey. So we had initially an idea to add co-op to our game. Uh, we didn't manage, I mean, we were rebuilding everything from scratch, and it took seven years to build a single-player game, it would take another seven to build a co-op game, uh, so we figured, okay, let's drop it, uh, let's just fo focus on single player, but initially we had at least a prototype where you had a body. And you could uh, hunt together with, with somebody else playing. As you can see, these are also very early versions of the Watchers. Uh, but we already had this idea that we are supposed to uh, work in herds or work uh, together. And also, uh, we were, this was also a very version, early version of our terrain placing system, so most of the level wasn't not that dense in vegetation as, as you saw so there. Okay, so... These were just examples of our prototypes. We had many, many, many more. These are, these are the ones which uh, I figured were inter uh, most interesting and actually the ones I could also show. There are some things which we still don't, don't want to show uh, because we use it still as inspiration. Uh, another thing that we did during that period was the Friday Fun Factory. So it was our internal game, game jam and it happened every week on Friday. And the rules were simple. You can do anything you want as long as you can do it in a day, and you can put it in Horizon somehow. And that, that was free for all, you could do whatever you wanted. And this resulted in a lot of crazy ideas, like really stupid weapons, uh, like um, throwable grenade robots, which uh, looked like bugs you would throw it that would run into like a herd of people or, uh, or robots and explode. Homing arrows, um, 
It also resulted in weird um, mounts. We at some point tested the Star Wars, um, uh, what do you call it, the hover bike. Uh, in our game, just just uh, for kicks, and we also at some point have had killer penguins because we could put in Horizon for 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 a day. Then why not? Um, so a lot of I'll be frank, like most of these things didn't end up in the game. Some did, uh, but it definitely was a wonderful idea to get our creative juices flowing to just test stupid stuff and have a lot of fun with it. Um, so once. Uh, we did all these prototypes. They had to come together to, into something, right? And at some point, we uh, needed to create this integrated demo that, to show that Horizon as a game, as a whole, is indeed possible. And somewhere around 2013, we de delivered our vertical slice, uh, a demo what's essentially of what Horizon could be. Now. Uh, many of you might be uh, are probably familiar with the concept of vertical slice, and uh, probably some of you are also, also know how controversial that concept is nowadays. So just to be clear here, um, even though ver technically vertical slice should be this vertical piece of a game which is polished to its final uh, final quality, in this case it was literally just taking all these prototypes, uh, stitching them together into a single experience, um, like a single 20-minute game, polishing it up a little bit, not going too crazy, just to show it as like a proof of concept more than, than anything else. Uh, and actually it did succeed. So we managed to create this small 20 minute game and it did show that um, this might actually work, that Horizon has a potential to be fun, but also putting all these things together showed us the limitations of our old processes, technology and tools. Essentially, a lot of these things, as cool as they were, uh, a lot of these things were st uh, st stringed together with like spit, chewing gum, and, uh, and uh, matchsticks, just to hold uh, as a single experience. Now, after, uh, after Killzone Shadowfall shipped, that was the moment where we could finally branch out, so Horizon stopped being a mod for Killzone and started being its own game. And that's the moment where we were able to make big changes to the game engine. Big, much needed changes. And um, I won't go through all the things that we changed, but I'll just try to show the things that the vertical slice showed us that we needed to change and uh, talk a little bit about the direction we decided to go with it. So. One of the biggest problems that we had uh, in, um, in our demo of Horizon was with item persistence. Now, what is item persistence? It's uh, when the game knows uh, about the item all the time. That means that if you have an item as a player, um, a sword, and you pick it up for, from the ground, you uh, then go to a container, store it in the container, an AI character takes that sword from that container, goes to a merchant, sells that sword to the merchant, and then you, go, you as a player, go to the merchant and buy it back. The game knows that through all these state changes, that is the same item. This is pretty basic, and it's fundamental for pretty much every item quest in a game. Um, but, but Killzone didn't work like this. The inventory system in Killzone was super simple. Uh, so essentially what happened is that an item would be represented by two different objects in the world, two different entities. So either you had uh, the object, which is the equipped weapon, or an object on the ground. That means when you dropped an item, uh, the item which you held got destroyed, and a new one got created in the same location while dropping, uh, which would be the pickup. And when you picked it up, the pickup would get destroyed, and a new item got uh, created on your hands. That was sufficient for Killzone, that didn't work for Horizon. And we fixed it mostly by essentially having, for every situation, a single entity, single game object, just having it in different states, and different, um, different kind of behaviors for different states, and they would just switch in between. Uh, another thing that we needed to definitely improve was streaming and world management. So if you have an open world game, you need to have asynchronous lo loading of data. You need, to, um, you need to be able to stream information because you won't be able to fit everything in memory at one time. In Killzone, we already had that. However, in a very simple fashion. We could only stream, stream data in, uh, linearly. Meaning, if you were in a part of a level, 
Once you finish with that thing, you went into a corridor. If a door behind you shut, you traveled through a corridor. And while you traveled through a corridor, the things behind you would get streamed out. The things in front of you would get streamed in. So essentially, while walking, the game would manage all the streaming. From your perspective, you were just walking along a corridor. But you never could go back. And you could never decide to go somewhere else. And so that was OK for a linear shooter. It wasn't OK for Horizon. So we needed to rebuild totally our streaming system for, for, the, for our new game. And um, the way we approach it is we did two things. One is super simple. We defined our world as a grid of tiles. And tiles were essentially streamed in based on distance. Uh, but that, that was only for geometry. We also created a concept of a scene. And scene, in this case, was uh, a collection of objects that can spawn in the world. So geometry, yes, but also things like entities. So uh, NPCs, items, explosions, everything. And that scene could contain a, a, a state machine, meaning a script which would manage its behavior. And, it would, uh, and the designer creating the scene would define how the scene streams in and when. Usually by defining its size and the distance would, would manage that, but then uh, these scenes didn't have a defined size. You can put them everywhere, anywhere, and you could also define how they stream in. Most of that work was actually completed much way into production, but that was the direction we chose uh, quite early. Uh, and find a final thing that we desperately needed to um, desperately needed to improve was scripting. Now in Killzone we use Lua for scripting. Now I know that Lua is quite popular in game development uh, as a scripting system, but it's slow and it's horrible to debug, and it's actually easy to make mistakes. Uh, what, what happens is that, uh, first of all, it's an interpreted language, so it's super slow. Second of all, uh, you refer to most game objects by either IDs or names or anything like that. So you can make a typo, and because it's an interpreted language, you only catch the error while the script runs. And that's usually way too late. And that already proved the problem in Killzone. Killzone um, earlier Killzones and Killzone Shadowfall. And we knew that we would be able to build a bigger game with, with that system. So we needed something totally, totally different. And the way we approached it is that we created our custom visual scripting language. And uh, it works in such a way that a script would be represented as a graph of nodes. And each node um, in that graph is a single C++ function. Now, that worked much better. Partly because, first of all, it's a visual graph, so you use your tool set to link to the, all the game objects, so there's no typing, no mistakes like that. Second of all, it's uh, C++, so it's super fast, at least compared to, to these Lua scripts. Uh, and uh, finally, because the way it would work is that before running the game, all these graphs would get translated into text automatically, uh, then it would get compiled by Clang, and then linked into the whole game. Now, because you have a compilation uh, process, you know about most of the errors before running the game. So you don't have to go to that specific place in the world which might take you 15 minutes to test your one script. Um, so yeah, after, after launch of Kills on Shadowfall, uh, there was this transition period in which we were shifting people from one project to the other. We also, in the meantime, built Killzone Intercept, which was our, like a uh, co-op DLC. Uh, but gradually, the Horizon team was growing. And finally, these big changes, which I mentioned, and many, many, many others, uh, were finally possible. The studio got expanded. New specialists got hired, people like Quest designers. And somewhere around 2014, Horizon went into full production. But that is a story for, for a built another day. So to sum this up. Horizon was a risky idea. To mitigate that risk, we used skills on Shadowfall as our technological springboard and took our time when prototyping Horizon. If you look at the timeline, we were prototyping Horizon for almost four years. Um, and this small team, working almost like an indie team, managed to prepare the basis for this big game that was supposed to come. So that's pretty much it. I hope you find it interesting, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Uh, now we move to questions, but I have a first question. Go ahead. Uh, 
we know that you work with Hideo Kojima for Decima Engine. Do you know? The, can you tell something about how do you work for? Because you are studio, you are using your own engine, mm -hmm. and this is completely different task to uh, outs outsource an engine for another company. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any plans to give okay. this Decima okay. Engine? Okay, so let's put it like that. I absolutely cannot talk about any plans. Unfortunately, uh, and when it comes to uh, like the process that we're having, um, w let's put it like that. Uh, I also cannot get too much into detail, but let's say that we are also learning how to do that, right? Because um, we are in constant communication with uh, with Kojima people about the engine, uh, but it's a pro it's a process to figure out how we work, how they work, and how to make it work all together. Um, I don't think it's a big of a secret, but it's one of these things I'm not sure I can talk about, <laughs> so I prefer not to. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. So, any questions? Вопросы в зале? О, есть вопрос. Since your visual scripting system was compiled, uh, what was your iteration time like from the point where you make a, a change to how something worked to you can actually test it in game uh, well uh, let's put it like that initially it wasn't that bad uh, because it wasn't initially it wasn't that bad because yes you had to uh, you were built the script you reloaded the game you had to recompile the script but then we managed to improve that so because it's a dynamic library we managed to build a system in which uh, you uh, essentially redo the script, push a button, and unless these were like some fundamental changes to the whole script and all logic, the script on the next run would run the updated version. So uh, at some point, our iteration time was really small. Uh, hello. Uh, what is your first of estimation of the game? Uh, Sorry? You, you said that you spent, uh, have spent sem seven years for the game, and what is uh, your first estimation for the game? Five years, four years? Uh, I, to be frank, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm quite sure that everybody expected for it to be a longer project. So uh, maybe it wasn't supposed to be seven, but I don't think anyone was surprised that it took that long. Uh, no, how much time uh, did you spend to the, your prototype in the Horizon Zero Dawn? Well, as I mentioned, the prototyping phase, the pre-production phase, was pretty much four years. It's for vertical slice or for the first playable demo? Uh, well, the thing is that we did a bunch of these demos in the meantime, right? So I'm talking about pretty much the time where we figured, okay, this is where shit gets real, and this is where we're going to production. Oh, and the, and the, you have spent three years for creating from prototype to for release? Uh, well... Uh, Everything, uh, every prototype, these demos, vertical slices, were not released at all, right? So these four years was like internal work only. Еще вопросы? Вот, вижу руку. Вы заранее, пожалуйста, понимаете, чтобы я бегал там. Hi. Uh, could you tell at which stage you decided that you will certainly complete the game? Because making a playable... Uh, uh, demo is not enough. Uh, so, uh, th there was certainly one one point in your production when you decided, yes, we will do this. Um, uh, actually, that was relatively early because um, the, the, if I remember correctly, uh, the way it was is was we were certain we're going to make this. The, qu the only question was why, and only initially we had this um, decision-making process in which we were deciding which game to make. Uh, because I told you we had two ideas and we played around with both ideas for a while and in the end we decided to make this uh, Horizon thing instead of that uh, steampunk action, uh, action adventure game. But at that point we were committed. So uh, yeah, it just had to work out. <laughs> uh, good day. Uh, I want to ask uh, if I may uh, it's more technical details. I'm not sure that you allow about talk about this, but um, can you talk more about uh, how how your visual script tools know uh, about entities on your scene? 
it seems like uh, more like Unreal stuff, Unreal Engine stuff, like Actor with Blueprint uh, assigned on it, or it's more like, I don't know, layer with, uh, with script, mm. and on this script you assign object from your scene and... So, uh, it's actually very similar to the Blueprint thing in Unreal Engine. The, w the way it works is that um, our, in, in, the, in the tools you define an entity, and you also define how you put that entity in, in the world. So, um, like a spawn point or something, some other object. So in your script, you essentially link to that object which spawns the entity, and that's how you essentially get handle of it. So, um, the script itself just links literally to what defines the entity in our toolset, and underneath it just resolves that that thing you link to is the entity and can work on it. If that answers your question. Uh, hi, Leshe. Uh, can you describe uh, key problems with scope mechanics? Why did you stop? With oh, uh, it's actually, uh, I think, quite simple. First of all, uh, I don't know if any of you went through this process of making, hey, let's make a single player game. Oh, no, you know what? Let's make it multiplayer. And then you realize that like, making s single player is like, mm -hmm. 20% of, no, it's like making single player is 20%, 80% would be making multiplayer. The technological complexity is so much higher doing all this because uh, the whole network thing comes in, then the server can thing comes in, then the syncing thing comes in, and then uh, comes cool design problems like, so what if somebody plays this game uh, offline for a while, then goes to co-op, and how do quests sync from the co-op version to the single player version, or maybe we do make two different games like I think Dungeon Siege did, uh, or maybe we sync it somehow like, um, Borderlands, borderlands, or we do something else, and then you realize if it's a co-op game, then you have to do different kinds of uh, also activities, which makes sense and more sense in co-op. And essentially, the problems just scale and scale and scale and scale. And figured, no, this is just too much. Like for what we want, we have already been spending so much time on this, so and we will be spending more time if we want to do co-op. We'll probably release this game on PlayStation Six. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks for sharing your huge experience. And uh, could you tell me, please, uh, how did you uh, validate your ideas, your prototypes? Uh, did you have any test group or you tested in uh, your employees, maybe? Um, so, um, actually, I'm not really sure how deeply into detail I can go about uh, go into this. Uh, but let's uh, let's just say that. Um, F uh, for a large per period of time, the way it worked is that we just tested internally. It was mostly our um, creative uh, team who was validating whether the idea works or not. So uh, our creative director would play through all these prototypes and he would be essentially the authority saying, this will work, this, uh, this not. Uh, but we as a team also played through all of these things and had impact, especially early, because if you're working with 12 people, it's easier to have a say, hey, this actually works, or not. No more questions? Um, I have a final question. The seven years is a long time for the project. How do you motivate the people to continue the work? Because it's, it's stressy. Uh, whips. <laughs> OK. Ah, you're in Amsterdam. I know. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, it, actually the way it worked is that um, a lot of people really wanted to make that game, right? It, the whole idea came from us. It wasn't some big dude from outside telling us what to do. And uh, people had a lot of say, at least in their areas, how things should work. And um, I'm not sure, was it just luck or through some magic or we just did things right? But through the seven year period, pretty much everyone wanted to make that game. Did your team grow during development? Yeah, it, it did grow. Uh, I'm not, don't, not, not sure about the numbers, okay. but we went through a big hiring process uh, pretty much, uh, well, since 2012 until like recently. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Leisure. Thank you so much.